Hey guys, so another lecture today. Uh, we are moving on to replication and I am trying something different again. Uh, so I got feedback that the kind of pre-recorded notes didn't work as well. That lecture went too fast and it was too difficult to follow what I was saying versus what was on the uh, notes. So um, I'm going to go back to writing notes by hand. I know this takes a little longer. Um, if you're okay with going faster, um, I guess just speed up the video or you can kind of skip forward to when new writing appears if you don't want to uh, wait so long for me to write. Um, and I am also moving on to kind of bigger lines, uh, which hopefully will make it easier to read what I'm writing. Um, so if we got more feedback, just let me know. Happy to always improve. Okay. Um, so, um, what we want to move to is replication of data, which means instead of having shared storage uh, in a situation where we have multiple nodes in the system, but the data is partitioned among the different nodes, um, now we want to replicate it. So, um, let's say that we have two, I'll kind of show you the... Um, the two options. So we can have partitioning of data where we have two different storage systems. So we have one computer and then we have another computer and maybe you know they're running some processes such as P1 and this would be P2. And then of course they are connected through some network. But in partitioning we have some data X residing here and some data Y residing here. In replication, got this writing on a bigger thing is actually harder. So we have a replication, okay, where we have the same system, maybe they're running some processes above, and now we're going to have X1 here and X2 here and y1 and y2. So ideally y1 and y2 would be equal and x1 and x2 would be equal to each other. Um, but if we lose any one of these replicas, then we still have all of the data um, residing, residing in the system and from that we can reconstruct another replica when we bring it back up. Whereas in this system, if we lose a replica, then y is gone or at least inaccessible until that node recovers and it recovers um, the contents of y or the state of y from stable storage okay so that's the difference um, you could also have a situation on the replication where you know you have multiple servers okay they're all connected to each other and then they're all running some processes above, and then maybe we have x1 uh, here and x2 here, and then y1 here and y2 here. Um, so in this scenario, we have both uh, partitioning and replication where each computer doesn't have the full copy of the data. Okay, so that's both partitioning uh, and replication. and replication. Cool. Okay. So, um, so we can define replication as the process of maintaining multiple copies of the same data on 
different computers. Okay, but what we don't want to end up in is a situation that is also called man with two clocks. Okay, so if you have only one watch and someone asks you what time it is, well, you can just tell them what your watch says. But if you have two watches, one on the left hand and on the right hand, and they're not perfectly synced with each other, such that you have two different readings, now you don't really know what time it is. It's not one or the other, it could be one or the other, but you don't really know how to um, tell. <laughs> so if we have two replicas of the same data and they don't match, we end up in the same situation and that we don't know which data is really correct. Okay, so want to avoid this setup or avoid this scenario by keeping the copies the same. Okay, so this gives us some desirable properties we can talk about. Okay, one of them is transparency. And um, transparency, or it means that um, clients should be unaware of interactions with multiple replicas. All right, so what this means is that as a client of the system, you just want to be able to read X and read Y and write X and write Y, and uh, it should not be uh, visible to you at all. You should not have to worry about which replica you're writing to or reading from, or in fact, how many replicas there are in the system at all. It should The system should behave as if there were only one replica that was infinitely reliable. Okay, um, and then we have the second property we want is consistency. Um, where we can kind of define it in different ways. Um, we can say that the copies of data can be temporarily inconsistent. Okay. And that depends kind of on application semantics. It may be okay for you to write to some data but then not see the change for a little while. Um, We'll get into this when we talk about the cap theorem, but what we would like to get is something called eventual consistency. Meaning that if or when all the messages are delivered and processes are recovered, then the data is consistent, right? So you can kind of have stronger or weaker consistency where copies are consistent all the time or they're temporarily inconsistent 
Um, that kind of depends on your application semantics, but you still want to define what consistency means to, means to you. All right, so then we can ask kind of why replicate data? And there's different um, reasons for it in, in, in different systems. So if you talk about it from the performance perspective, um, replication can bring data closer to users. Okay. So if there's only one copy of the data in the whole of all of the internet, then depending where your client is, they might have to suffer significant latency, network latency, to get to that one copy. Whereas if there are many, many copies in the internet, perhaps one in every edge network, then there's always some copy of the data close to you. So uh, we can bring data closer to users and uh, speed up, primarily to speed up reads, but uh, you can also speed up writes uh, if you will need to sacrifice consistency. Okay, so um, having more copies of data can actually um, basically reduces network latency and that speeds up access. Okay, and then the other reason is to increase availability. And that's the example I showed before, that if we have more copies of the data, some of the copies can go away or temporarily become um, unavailable due to node failures or network partitioning. But nevertheless, there's some copy of the data that um, exists and is accessible and we can um, read from it or recover a replica from the copies that remain. Okay, so we can kind of look deeper into availability. So if we define some variable p that's going to be the probability of server failure or replica failure, um, we can then for n servers Define p to the n as the probability that all servers fail. Okay. But if we look at 1 minus p to the n, okay, that's going to be the probability that at least one server is up. Okay. So numerically, we can say that, let's say P equals 0 0.05. So we have a pretty small probability of uh, server failure. But that's going to translate to about 18 days of downtown, downtime. Per year. So that's quite a lot. How can we bring this down? Well, if we have two servers, so let's say uh, n equals two, we can calculate the probability that at least one of those servers will be up, okay, which gives us about 99.75% of uptime. And so downtime is going to be nine days. But if we look at something like one minus P to the five, the downtime goes down to 10 seconds. 
So cool, so that's a quite a powerful tool. So even if we have, you know, okay reliability on servers, but we have a lot of them, we can significantly reduce downtime. And that's how, you know, different types of service providers say we have 99.999% reliability or five nines reliability. Well, what they're doing is they're basically playing this numbers game by having multiple copies of the same data, um, not having unbelievably reliable servers or, you know, people watching those servers like a hawk. Well, I mean, they do have people watching those servers, but um, mostly those numbers come just from having numbers of servers and replication in the system. Okay. So then we can um, look at replication versus caching to try to kind of um, see how those two systems work together or how they're different from each other. So what caching does is basically maintain previously requested copies of the data. So if you think of something like a content distribution network, um, you have some server nearby and you make your web requests through that server. Now, when your request goes through that, the, that server doesn't have the copy of your data. It's going to request it from somewhere else in the internet. But when the copy arrives back on that server, that server will keep it for a while in case you need it or someone else needs it. So that's, ca that's caching. It's basically keeping copies of whatever data comes through. Right? Um, the difficulty with this is that cache data can be stale. Um, it's not clear how that cache data gets refreshed right there's usually some time to live or some other mechanism but just because the data has been saved at a computer doesn't mean it hasn't changed in the system as a whole which means that the cached uh, copy could be stale if it's not refreshed somehow so On the other hand, in the replication in a replication system, the replication system would require that all the data gets updated, or uh, more specifically, that any read to your data will give you the latest copy of the data, regardless of how it's implemented on the backend. Okay, so effectively, caching is you can think of it as replication without a consistency protocol. So you're increasing the availability of data, but you're not guaranteeing that it's in any way consistent. Okay. Um, you know, there could be also this, this issue that your cache only has some of the items of a page, but not all of them. So, you know, it, does it really increase availability? Well, yes, for the items that it has, but maybe not for the whole data set that you might need, such as all the um, objects that are required by a web page. Okay, so that's kind of a short overview of, of replication. So next we'll talk about view synchronous communication. Okay. Um, also called view delivery. Okay. So if we have a system with multiple replicas, uh, maybe we have four of those boxes. Um, this would be P1 and it holds X and Y. And then we have kind of four of those together. This is P2 with X and Y.
clear enough, clear enough. Um, so, you know, they can, each replica can hold all the elements or they could hold some subset of elements, um, right? We have basically replicated shared memory. So um, we want to apply a transaction to this set of replicas. Okay, so we can draw kind of the lifetime of these replicas from left to right as arrows. And let's say this one fails here, but it recovers and goes on. And maybe this one just kind of starts here at some point. Okay, so this will be our P1, P2. And now there's a message that says maybe this is a right X and then it goes like this. Okay. And maybe this is the entire transaction or just a portion of the transaction. This is basically the end result of the transaction. Okay, so we want to write to X. Um, and we don't want to just change the data at one of the replicas. We want to change it at um, all of the replicas. So which replicas should we change this at, right? Um, so if P3 fails and doesn't receive this message, should the message be delivered here to P2? Um, not clear, right? Um, if P3 recovers, should we somehow deliver that message later? Not clear, right? Um, should the message be delivered to P4 if it wasn't around when the message sent was sent? Not clear, right? Like which set of messages is part of the, which set of replicas is actually part of the system, right? Should we even be allowed to write to X at all if we can't reach all the replicas? How could we possibly know this, that replicas can't be reached by the time we do a write X, all right? So we don't really have the tools right now to try to understand um, what to do intuitively, right? So what we can do to solve this problem is to define views over this system. Okay, so here we're gonna have one view, we'll call this V0, which has um, uh, uh, replicas one, two, and three. Okay, at the time that P3 fails, we logically enter into another view. Okay. And then at the time when P4 joins the fray, we have another view. And then at the time that this recovers, we have another view. Okay. So we can divide this network into these different views of the network or different group memberships. Um, and then reason about correctness of replication within each view. Okay. So um, each membership change will result in a new view.
And this is also the reason why we keep uh, membership changes as part of the log in Raft. If you kind of go back to that paper, um, that's what Raft also does because it needs to reason about who is part of the who is part of any particular um, uh, any particular election. Okay. Um, also, view delivery. Uh, view delivery or kind of announcing of what the view is to other nodes um, is totally ordered with other messages. Okay, so each message is sent in one view or another view, right? So in this case, the right of X would be sent in view zero because that was the view as far as P1 was concerned when, um, um, when the right X message or the commit of that occurred. Um, okay, and so then request occurs, requests occur within a view. And so for these view synchronous communications, um, we can think of requirements for correctness of, of this. And we will have agreement. which will mean if a correct process P delivers message M, oops, lost my pen. Yep. Um, if a correct process P delivers message M in some view G, then all other processes deliver M in view G. Um, so this is not that different from kind of normal group um, uh, broadcast type messaging where um, you know we got it if one delivers then all deliver but now delivery also has to be tied to a particular view right because we need to know whom we're delivering to and that comes from what is the membership of the group in a particular view okay? the membership of group G in here um, which is defined by the view Okay, we also have integrity. Which means uh, P delivers message, delivers M. Only once or exactly once.
and it also means that sender of m and p in view of m. Okay, so if the message was sent by somebody in some view, then the, all the nodes that deliver the message M also need to be in that view in which M was sent. Okay, so messages are completely tied to a particular um, view. Okay, and then we can talk about validity. Um, okay, so failure to deliver M to some process P elements of EG, get this element, fling light, okay, uh, in VG results in a new view, VG prime, or I guess VG prime, the prime is on the G, we have a new group, such that P is not the element of V G prime. Um, and that is delivered, that view is delivered right after M. Okay, so let's look at some examples of different views and deliveries. Okay, so let's say that we have this situation where we have uh, P Q and R, okay, and we have some, um, actually, what's the best way to draw this? I guess the best way to draw this is to do it a whole bunch of times, okay. So we have one view here, this will be our view zero, and this will be our view one, okay. Same example, same example. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to copy this over. Okay, perfect. So, if we then have different scenarios here, so let's say that we have this, we have some message being sent. Okay. Um, we have some message being sent, but then lost. We have some message being sent like this, okay, 
and we have some message being sent like this. Okay. Um, which of these, which of these situations is allowed versus not allowed in terms of um, view synchronous communications? Um, I'll give you guys a minute here to ponder. You can pause the video, um, ponder, and then we can get into the answers. Okay, so this scenario is allowed. Right, this is fine. We're sending the message in uh, view zero and we're delivering it in view zero. So this is okay. Okay, this is also allowed. Why? Well, because we're not delivering the message. Okay, so if the message is being delivered here at P, Q, and R, here it's not being delivered by anybody, and so this is also allowed. Okay, um, this is going to be disallowed because if we're sending the message here, P is going to try to deliver it, right, and then it sends it to other nodes, but now we're delivering in a different view, so this is disallowed. Okay, and of course here we have a delivery at P, at Q, and at R, but this is happening in a different view, and so this is also going to be disallowed. All right, um, so we have some definitions. This is nice. We know what view synchronous communications means. The next question is, um, why is this useful? Um, so that's a good question. Um, what do you guys think? What would be the reason for enforcing this types of group, group agreements? Okay. Um, well, one nice thing about it is that in any particular view, we have some set of nodes that are part of the, of the view. And so we know N in each view. Right. Why is this important? Well, if we know N, we can use it potentially to set up quorums. Okay. And once we have quorums, we can have some sort of agreement or we can solve, more, probably more importantly for this, the readers and writers problem. which allows us to figure out the correct size of the read and write quorums. We discussed this one a um, few lectures back. Okay, so the biggest problem with quorums is that we don't necessarily know N in a system when there's churn, but now we have churn and we have a way of dealing with that such that for any uh, time period between node churn, we can know N or the number of nodes in the system. Okay? Now, as the number of nodes in the system grows, these membership changes will be quite frequent and this becomes no less correct, but kind of difficult to update, right? So it may be that it becomes difficult to deliver nodes within the same view between the view changes because the membership changes are kind of happening more frequently or, or are likely to happen during kind of the end-to-end -end delivery time for the different uh, four messages, right? Um, the other nice thing about it is that if we know a view, we can collect global state for that view.
So if we want to reason about the correctness of, this, of the global state, if we want to you know, run a distributed snapshot algorithm, well, we still need to know some set of nodes that are in here and we can do it within a view or basically collect state um, between nodes that were part of a particular view and that state should be consistent. Okay, so have, knowing who's part of the system and who's not is good to know and we can put boundaries on that using these view announcements. Okay. So let's look at um, the last concept for today which is replication system correctness. Okay, so what we want to do is start building, actually getting close to implementing these fault, these types of fault tolerant services. Okay. So let's say we have some client one, okay, and we have some replica manager, RM replica manager, A. And then we're going to have some clients too. And so um, client one will start issuing requests such as write uh, to replica A some value of X, okay, and maybe write A Y, okay, and then client two can say uh, or read not get let me do read a x and read a y and client two will be able to read exactly what client one wrote into the system okay so that works pretty well but if we have a situation where we have some client one and we have two replica managers, and both of the writes end up going to here. So we have writes a x right uh, actually no I'm gonna send the second right to here right B y. okay but then client 2 still ends up doing the same reads Client 2 will now not be able to get um, here the latest value of y. Right? So you could say, well, why is it that the client is actually writing to two different replicas and client 1 is writing to two different replicas and client 2 is reading from not the right replica? Well, that's a good question. And the reason is that the client 1 doesn't actually know what they're writing to, right? Client 1 just actually does a write. So they should not be aware of how many replicas are there and this client should not be aware of where he's reading from and so they're really just doing writes and if the system is not managing these replica managers correctly if they're not talking to each other and replicating data um, then you can end up in this situation where you'll be getting stale data out okay so we can define correctness in a number of ways okay? We can say that a service is linearizable Yeah. 
is linearizable if for any execution Uh, there is an interleaving of events such that um, same order as if on a single copy or sorry, same result of reads and order consistent with real-time execution. So obviously this is going to be hard um, because real time is difficult, right? So it's really difficult to know where, when events happen and um, we can define linearizable, but it's pretty difficult to implement, right? So this example above with two replicas is not that, well, maybe things Maybe there's an order consistent with real-time order, but um, uh, we're not going to get the same result as if the single copy, right? There is no way to order these events such that we have a read two from or read a x and read a y in a way that gives us the same result as if everything was being written to the single copy, right? Or reordering these events does not help. Um, Okay, so, well, <laughs> I guess with the caveat, I guess the reads could have happened first, right? But um, perhaps I can come up with a more complicated example where that's not possible, uh, which actually I will in a second. So um, what we actually want these systems to be is sequentially consistent. Okay, so we're going to have the same result as if on a single copy. And um, order consistent with program order. All right, what this means is that if we have um, right X and right Y, um, then the writing of X will actually happen before writing of Y, right? So we're keeping the order just of a single program or a single process. We're not reordering events within a transaction, but um, we can reorder things between transactions, which is um, kind of what we talked about when it got into serializability, okay? So, um, okay, with that, let me ask you guys a question. If the following order of events is um, linearizable, sequentially consistent,
or neither. Okay. And the order of events is this. We're going to have C1 do a um, we're going to have let's say set balance which is going to be a right but I'll do it in this fancy way on a replica B where we set X is equal to Y to 1 um, we're going to have C2 called get balance from A We're going to read y, and that will return 0. Okay. We're going to have c2 that get balance from a of x, which returns 0. And then we're going to have set balance of by C1. On replica A of Y equal to 2. Okay. So is the sequence of operations linearizable, sequentially consistent, or neither? Well, it's not linearizable because uh, we don't really know what the real timestamps were, and anyway, it's not practical, so we can throw that away. Um, but is it sequentially consistent? Well, it's not, but why not? Because we're not getting the data that uh, we should be, right? So after C1 sets the balance of x to 1, um, C2 gets balance of x equal to 0, and so um, that is wrong, right? That is not um, the same result as if we are running this on a single replica, right? So how could we change this to make this sequentially consistent, right? Uh, you could put it on a single writer or on a single replica, right? But you can also have some sort of reconciliation or some sort of replication mechanism here some sort of a replication mechanism that would change the uh, would make sure that the write propagates to all the different replicas before any reads all right um, how could we do it well in a view we know that there are some sort of replicas a and B in this case, we can have a quorum over them. Well, it's a little difficult with two. Well, I guess all of them would have to agree, <laughs> right? But if you have more nodes, you can reach a quorum and then you kind of define the right number of readings of readers and writers. And we'll kind of, we'll talk about next, we'll talk about it um, uh, in the next lecture about how to do that. But that's a certain, that's certainly a possibility. So the last thing I want to leave you guys with is the difference between um, serial equivalence which is also called serializability versus sequential consistency So we've been going over a lot of different terms in the last couple, couple-ish lectures, and so I want to kind of draw a difference between those. Okay. Um, so this has to do with transactions, which is uh, same result as if serial transaction execution. And this is as if on a single replica. Okay. 
Okay, so when we talked about serializability, we assumed there's only one replica, and we just cared about the order of operations. When we talk about sequential consistency, there are multiple replicas, and we want the same result um, as if on a single replica. Okay, so the two are really kind of orthogonal questions. So we can look at this example above and ask if it's sequentially consistent. Well, we know it's not, but we can also ask whether or not it's serializable if we look at um, the, the clients as kind of executing different transactions, right? So the problem we have here is that both of them are using the same variables, right? They're both using X and Y. So client one does a write to X and then does a write to Y. And then client two um, reads from Y and then reads from X, okay? so client two ends up reading the variable of x that one wrote, but it's not reading that variable of y, okay? So this could be made, this is not serializable, right? But if you had a scheduler, you could move these events down, right? And then you would have a serializable execution, okay? So um, that's, kind of an introduction to replication. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some methods for actually implementing this, and we will also get into the cap theorem. Okay, so thank you guys, and I'll see you soon.